We start again. Just wanted to say something. Compared to the other days, you had one full day about uh, um, remote sensing for forestry, remote sensing uh, for agriculture, um, et cetera, et cetera. Today, we have just this morning about marine applications. And uh, we uh, have theory, we don't have time for practicals because this afternoon, as you know, we are going to do something else. So I asked Amalia to put in the chat links to uh, other additional material and practical exercises about uh, uh, radar for oil spills or sheet detection. We have, uh, um, uh, for example, developed with uh, uh, Copernicus, Rus, um, uh, it was a service running for three years. We had uh, uh, webinars uh, also with practical ex exercises using SNAP for ship detection and oil spills. So Amalia will put in the chat the link to those. So if you are interested in the subject, I really advise that after listening to the theory, you also look at the exercises, because otherwise uh, you will not fix uh, this concept if you are not applying what you learned also from the practical point of view. So this is for the practicals. And then I also uh, asked Amalia to put a link to uh, the radar MOOC, the Massive Online Open Course that we did, because uh, I think that also there there is something about um, radar applications to um, oil spills and ship detection. So please have a look at the chat. Yeah, so uh, what I was telling you about here is what is the physics behind the observation of oil spill with SAR. So we have the oil that is smoothing the ocean surface which means you receive no backscatter or you receive less backscatter. And what, uh, what is happening is here, called, so over the ocean surface, you have the so-called break, break scattering. And on oil, you have a departure from break scattering. Uh, in which conditions are you able to detect oil with SAR? So when you have here low wind speed, so we have seen that wind is uh, something important to generate the roughness over the ocean. If you have low wind speed, you basically have a flat ocean surface. It doesn't matter if you have oil or not, so everything is flat, so everything will be uh, having low uh, backscatter. And this, uh, so when you have moderate wind speed, then you have the generation of the roughness of the ocean waves. And so if you have detections, uh, it's, it's uh, mostly probably pollution, soil pollution. And the other limit is when you have very high wind speed, because when we have very high wind speed, the oil starts to mix in the waves. And so you don't have this uh, smoothness anymore, so you cannot detect the oil. Uh, how they look like oils in, uh, in sun images? So we have talked about operational discharges. So you have one example here of tank washing procedure, where you have the ship that is tracked by the automatic identification system. And then behind, you have this trail of dark, this uh, line dark line, which is oil. And then you have like uh, for platform source pollution, you have uh, yeah, rounded curvilinear shapes of, of oil. And then you have like accident, which are, uh, yeah, in case you have an accident, it can be discontinued patch. So you have different uh, oil <coughs> patches flowing, floating over the ocean. And then you can also have a uh, rounded shape when you have a platform accident like, uh, like here. Uh, just a little information about uh, with the oil type. So there was some experiment to provide what, what, uh, how the oil type influence the uh, SAR oil spill. So you see like light uh, fuel and heavy fuel. So when you have a high f heavy fuel, you usually, dif yeah. Independently on the, on, the, on the wavelength of your radar, you, you receive a little bit more backscatter. Back and uh, 
and you see also uh, the different polarization, what, what, was, what was measured. Uh, here is also a little bit uh, about the wavelength influence. So you see that different uh, frequency or wavelength. So who doesn't know about frequency and wavelength? OK. So the radar needs to transmit the pulse using a certain frequency. And frequency and wavelength are uh, reciprocal. So it's one over the other. So you either have high frequency, which means the pulses are very short wavelength, or you have low frequency with longer wavelength. So the acronyms here are L, S, C, X, K, U. These are the usual uh, frequency bands, which range from uh, centimeters wavelength to yeah, tens of centimeters wavelength to centimeters wavelength. For example, I show here, like uh, you have like an X band, you have something between 1.8 and 4.5 uh, centimeters. Uh, so the different frequency or wavelength uh, will give you different response because uh, increasing the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, and the higher is the backscatter that you receive because you are observing the, what we said before, the capillary waves, which have wavelength, ocean wavelength of centimeters. So these uh, waves are then more resonant with the transmitted pulse. So then you receive more. And this is what, what was observed. So you see here, so from longer wavelength to shorter wavelength, you have this, uh, this curve. What, what is, uh, so the question is then, we have seen that oil appears as a dark patch in the SAR image, the SAR amplitude image, right? So then the question is, do we have other phenomena which also produce uh, dark patches? So these phenomena are there, and they are called lookalikes because they look like oil spill, but they are not. They are other phenomena. So here are some examples. So you have ship wake. So someone was asking what is happening is that the ship is moving, and basically the movement of the ship is smoothing the surface, and then you see this dark trail. So not very long, but you see behind the ship. Then we have uh, natural leak due to natural uh, biogenic activities in the oceans. And then we have the so-called internal waves. You see this, uh, you can see that are waves, but you see the pattern between uh, bright and dark patches, right? Then we have rain cells. So if you have strong rain over the ocean, the rain also uh, dampens the roughness of the ocean surface. And then you have this uh, structure of uh, dark and uh, white uh, circular uh, uh, yeah, patches or in the sun image. And then we have also low wind speed, of course, because if you have low wind, you have no backscatter. We have already told, I already have told you this several times. So uh, then you have, uh, for example, here you see on, on the right most picture, you have an oil spill, but there are also some uh, low wind area. So among these uh, lookalikes, uh, the most difficult one to discriminate are of course, the ship wakes, uh, because you never know if it's, if it's a real wake or if it's oil, and also the natural slick. So the others with use of uh, additional information. So we have said like using more satellites is always good. So if you have rain cells, there are coastal radars that can tell you how is the rain rate at a certain time. Uh, you can use uh, model weather forecast data to say where is the low wind speed. 
So if you detect something, but then you cross match this with other sources like ancillary data, then you can discriminate this. So natural leak, as I said, they are natural, so you don't have anything to, uh, to kind of discriminate uh, them from oil. So how, which steps you can do to detect oil? And uh, as Francesco told you, these are the steps that you also find in the SNAP toolbox. So if you go there, you download an image, there are the algorithm already developed, which is oil, and it asks you to uh, provide some steps. So usually there are some pre-processing steps, which uh, my, I think they are not implemented in, uh, or partially not implemented in, in SNAP, which is, for example, you want to uh, smooth a little bit more the, the speckle. I don't know who doesn't know about speckle, because speckle is the characteristic of SAR. So you see the image appears uh, gray and pepper. They told you about the first day. And this, of course, this randomness, it makes the detection of oil a bit more difficult, right? So what you can do, you can apply the speckle filter, which are also uh, implemented in SNAP. There are different ones, uh, and this uh, helps in smoothing a bit the speckle, so reduce the speckle. Uh, then the steps that are kind of basic and mandatory are like, from the image, you want to mask the land, because on land, there will be uh, no oil that we are interested in. Then there is a fundamental uh, step, which is uh, dark area detection. We have said that oil appears dark, so low backscatter area. And that means you have to detect dark areas in the image. And you can do it several ways. So with uh, applying a global threshold or like selecting the uh, region of interest. Um, and then once you have this, you want to extract the parameters. So you want to have, of course, the position. You want to have uh, the length of the oil with the coverage, the widths. So basic information. And then it's passed to the final user and say, OK, look, here there is oil. It has this uh, size and um, it has these parameters. OK? And then the last step is classification which I'm not sure if it's not there, it's implemented, probably not, but this is uh, also a fundamental step because, as I said, if you detect a dark area in a SAR image, does not mandatory mean that that is oil because there are lookalikes. So what you do, you do the classification. So oil and lookalikes. And on this, we can discuss like days, how to do it, so there are it's several techniques. Nowadays, artificial intelligence is very, very, very well developed. So there are many, many algorithms using uh, machine learning. You have different algorithms like neural networks, support vector machines. You have uh, decision trees. You have multiple things. What is needed for the classification is actually a database of ground truth. So you have to classify, to train your classifier, you need to have example of oil and example of lookalikes, which then are used to train your network. And then you can use the train network to provide the information for new images, right? And here is, yeah, near real time. I put it here. This is, yeah, uh, normally between 20 to 30 minutes from the downlink of the data to the base station, right? So. Example. These are examples that, again, so if you see the chat, you can do it also uh, with Snap. So you have here, in this case, it's a Terrasarix image acquired over North Sea. So the bright dots that you see here, some of them are ships, some of them are oil platforms. And then you see attached to the oil platform, you see this trail of dark area. So 
Land mask, in this case, is not applied because we are totally on ocean, so there is no land. The first step is, for example, in this case, you select the region of interest. Here is the zoom. And then the second step is the dark. So you want to detect the, the, the dark area. So applying like a, a threshold, say, OK, all the pixels that are below certain values are dark area, belonging to the dark area. So then you have the detections. And from these, of course, you want to extract the parameter and provide the classification. Is it oil? Is it not oil? Here is some information. You see, classical parameters are latitude and longitude of, in this case, of the center of the area of the oil spill. It provides, uh, you can provide perimeter, you can provide uh, the, in this case, it was used um, narrow network to classify this. What is the probability of this dark patch, dark patch to be an oil spill? So in this case, it's 99%, so it's quite high. And of course, you can do it also for, for, also for the other one. So now that you have this information, I guess if you go uh, download some, there are plenty of Sentinel images with uh, oil spills. So you can go download the image and apply the steps. So uh, then it would be easier for you to uh, get some, some, some of this uh, information uh, in your head. Yeah. So uh, for what this can be used? So for example, oil well locations. So, uh, so here, for example, there are, so the movie maybe show it again. So there are um, three consecutive images that were acquired over an area. So we talked about uh, oil seepage. So oil seepage are natural uh, yeah, containers of oil below uh, the ocean floor. And basically, they release oil once in a while. And this is where the oil production company are interested in, because you see where you have to put your platform, right? So in this case, um, it's the other way around. So there was a platform there that was destroyed by an hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, and that the oil well was never kept. So from the ocean floor, was, it's always coming oil. And from the bottom to the up, then you see oil is going up. And then you see it on the ocean surface. right? So then using multi-temporal SAR images, you can uh, yeah, identify where this is happening. And this is basically the basic approach that I showed you before. So dark area detection on the different uh, times of the SAR image. Then you co-registrate with the GIS software. And then you see that the oil is have like a common area where it always pop up. So the, then you get an information where uh, the oil uh, the oil well is located, right? Um, so I, I'm not sure if you are uh, so much interested in, in this. So I will probably go fast and uh, focus also a little bit more on, on the ship detection. Otherwise, we don't manage to, to finish in time. But I just want to give you uh, an overview. So this, what I've shown you, is the classical approach using single pole. So in the morning, I told you a lot, maybe boring part about Pulsar, polarimetry, but Pulsar is very useful for discriminating oil and lookalikes, especially because to train the network or to train your classifier, you need data sets with the ground truth. And the problem is not to having oil examples, but the problem is having 
ground truth with lookalikes so that you know that that dark patch is, I don't know, a biogenic slick. So uh, with Pulsar, there is a little bit uh, more information that can be exploited. So it's not based on the classification, but it's based directly on the differentiating the scattering mechanism that uh, are giving for oil and for sea surface, right? So, and, and this, is the this is the polarimetric scattering mechanism. So with the polarimetric features that was, were introduced in the morning, you want to differentiate between what's so-called Bragg and non-Bragg scattering mechanism, which means on Bragg we have seen if you have a slick free, so oil free ocean surface, you have this type of scattering mechanism. If you have oil covered sea surface, you have a departure from back. And this is discri the discrimination step that you want to do. And you can do it with, with Pulsar data, right? I just um, uh, give you here some of the most common techniques uh, for either quad pole data or for dual pole data. So literature is vast, so if you search, there are very, very many uh, papers about, about the topic. So I could not put everything here. So, but these are one, one of the most one. In particular, today I will focus on the, on the dual pole, so the so-called corporized phase difference, which if you recall in the morning, so this is the phase difference between the channel HH and VB, okay? We have then a dual pole, uh, dual pole measurements, so HH and VV, and these polarimetric features were already introduced in the theoretical part. And from this, we can extract the so-called CPD, so corporate phase difference. And this uh, parameter has um, the distribution related to the cor correlation between the HH and VV channel. So you see here the plot of the probability density function of the CPD varying the correlation. So you see low correlation, so the dotted uh, curve is uh, very wide. So it means you have very large standard deviation when you have this type of phenomena and you go up to uh, rho, that is the correlation to 0, 9, or the case of one, you will have a Dirac function, so perfect uh, Dirac function, and you have for high correlation that the distribution standard deviation becomes smaller. So, and this is what uh, it has been used for oil spill and uh, lookalike uh, discrimination. So, as I said, so, ocean surface and weak damping uh, slicks, like the biogenic slicks, they either call for high correlation or low standard deviation. Or, um, yeah, or low standard deviation. And oil covered sea surface will have like, uh, oil covered sea surface will have either low correlation or very high standard deviation. So, Remind that if we have Bragg, we have high correlation, and then the standard deviation, you know what standard deviation is, right? Okay. Then you have very low standard deviation, so the spread from the mean. If you have low correlation between the channels, then you have a broadening of the distribution. So, and this is the case. So here, from left to right, so, showing a SAR image. So here is left is the intensity VV of uh, a SAR image acquired over an accident, so an oil spill. You see this large dark area, which we want to analyze. Then in the middle, it is showing the standard deviation map. So it used the CPD information and per each pixel, the standard deviation is measured around uh, a certain window, right? 
And then what you see? You see that over the oil, you have very high standard deviation. So, and on the ocean, which appears dark in the middle image, you have very low standard deviation. And this is uh, similar. So this uh, basically gives you an optical view of the previous uh, polarimetric uh, model that was introduced, right? Again, so there was a question about what, what is the effect of wind uh, behind the platforms and so on. So here you see in the North Sea, the bright spots are oil platforms on the left, uh, on the left hand uh, image, it's again, the intensity VV uh, polarization. As you see, together are touched or close to the platform, dark areas. So it's there highlighted what is real, what is the oil, and what is actually the wind wick. So wind is blowing from northeast, so then it creates the wake behind the platform. And what is nice about uh, the CPD is that if you see in the, in the middle uh, image, so oil will still have high CPD standard deviation, but not the wake. So that means you don't need to classify this between oil and lookalike. So the lookalikes are kind of, yeah, almost automatically discarded, right? Uh, so what, what about other lookalikes? So I told you about natural slicks. So this is another example where you have uh, a side image. In this case, landmask was applied, it's in purple. And then you see close to the coast some biogenic activities. So these are like uh, this, uh, yeah, pointed by the arrow. And surprise, no. So when you see in the CPD map, this uh, does not give you a high standard deviation. So in correlation to the area where you see the biogenic leak in the intensity image, you don't see it in the CPD standard deviation map because these leaks are so-called weak damping. So they're not completely destroying the roughness of the ocean surface. They still appear dark in the side image, but using the, the dual pole, then uh, you don't, you, you see like low standard deviation um, everywhere. Right? So this is another technique to discriminate between oil and lookalikes. This is uh, so the most important part because you want to avoid to detect false alarms and lookalikes are false alarms. The more false alarms you detect, the more you need to go out and check, right? So, and because SAR, as I said, it's an early warning system, you want to prevent to send out a warning and then the patrol control has to go there and check what is happening. So of course, this has to be, so the lower the false alarms, the better, right? Uh, yeah, so this is basically a verification of the, of the, uh, of the scattering model over oil and over sea surface. So here are just the plots that shows you once estimated the, the standard deviation over slick free sea surface and oil, you see the oil has a very broad distribution of the CPD. While for, for, for C, it's very uh, narrow CPD. While this is not happening between C and the oil lookalike, right? Because they are, yeah, please. So the, the wrong target, you mean the, the lookalikes? Wrong, wrong, uh, yeah. 
false alarms. And detection of real is uh, for oil is very uh, low because uh, actually, I mean, I, I said if you are in the range of wind speed over the ocean eh, between two to 14, 15 meters per second, if there is uh, oil, you definitely see it as a dark patch. So, uh, what can happen is if you have a lower wind speed, then you don't see anything because even if you have oil, you don't have the sea roughness, right? So you don't have wind. So the sea surface is completely flat. So if you take, for example, an image of a lake, right? A small lake, this will be completely back. If you see a sun image over a lake and then you spill some oil, of course, this will be undetected because you have low backscatter everywhere. And the same will, up, will happen if you have high wind speed, because if you have very high wind speed, the oil start to mixture with the waves. So you don't have any more like the waves and the oil, but you will have like a mixture. So you will have roughness everywhere. And that's why the oil will be undetected. But if you are in this range, you definitely, if there is oil, you definitely have a low backscatter return. And this uh, means that in the side image, you see a dark patch. OK? Uh, yeah, so some example of the same applied with different bands. Here is an example of C band, an example of L band. So just some, some example to show you that this approach works uh, quite well in different bands and different, uh, also for different satellites, which shows you that it's quite robust. Then, uh, yeah, we did some, some, also some analysis how the CPD evolved. So we have, so the question before, uh, how often the satellites come over and we told you that SAR is quite flexible, it can change. Uh, the incidence angle, so the incidence angle is the angle with which the, uh, the antenna beam is looking at, at uh, the ocean surface. So basically here you can see uh, the plots, so which show you how the backscatter variates uh, along the incidence angle and how the CPD uh, variates along the, the incidence angle. What was found is that in most cases, so the CPD performs in the oil detection a little bit better than uh, the single polarization one. Yeah, so here is another example. So this was uh, during an, um, yeah, an annual exercise from uh, the Norwegian colleagues. So they basically do this exercise so they to train in case of oil spills accidents. So what uh, measurements needs to be taken and at the same time, there was some satellite acquisition. So you see on the left-hand side, you see SAR image with three different dark patches. So one was crude oil, another was emulsion, and, one, and the other one was palm oil. And uh, then you see through the CPD, if you run the algorithm and then you perform the detection to basically detect the crude oil, but not detect the palm oil. So palm oil is vegetable oil, so it's not uh, heavy oil, so it's classified as lookalikes in this case. So here, uh, to show you that um, you can differentiate these uh, types of oil. Yeah, so because in the morning it was quite boring, I guess, for you, but I discuss a lot about polarimetric features, what you can do, what you cannot do. And here is just some example of the polarimetric features that were uh, introduced in the morning, how this looks like when you have uh, 
different oil types. So these are uh, some literature suggesting to use entropy, some others suggesting using yeah, the geometric intensity. So literature is vast, so there are pro and cons of each uh, approach. Uh, but what, what uh, was nice was to uh, compare all, diff all, all these different uh, features and see if actually, yep, sorry. I was, actually it was not me doing it. So I was sitting on uh, my desk and waiting the satellites to pass over and get the image and process the image. So this uh, experiment is, uh, I guess, done annually from the Norwegian institution NOFO. Don't ask me the acronym right now, I don't remember. But uh, they do it in the North Sea. And basically, they, they are training themselves to be prepared when an accident is happening. So they intentionally put some oil or some in this case, uh, palm oil, and then they go with the boat and train, well, like, like you train in an emergency case. So suddenly the ringing is and then you have to, you know, take your way. They are training because if you are not training, then an accident is happening. And then, of course, time is precious. So you want to, as far as possible, go there and limit the area affected by the oil, right? So this is basically, yeah, please. So it's a, it's a response training in response in case of emergency. So they basically they go with the ship, they release the oil with the ship, and then they take measurements. So they spray uh, the solvents or they put these uh, balloons, about floating balloons to limit the area, but you need to practice it, right? Are there any other questions about the experiment or? Okay. Yeah, so here, just don't want to bother you so much. So what is the message here, if you see this table, these are like the list of all the tables used for oil spill detection. And the message here is that if you see the, I don't know, top 10, uh, most of them are polarimetric features. So polarimetry, it's an added value also when you want to train your machine learning algorithm, okay? Okay, so then I guess it's time to go uh, to switch to ship detection. Uh, if there are no specific questions, yes? Um, you showed a lot of uh, difficulties to detect the, to detect the oil spills and the uh, drilling. So how far are we to, to have a legal, strong legal, uh, let's say, Trying to, to prove that some ship in the sea did some drill jump, drill dumping, because I, I think it's now it's uh, basically holds no legal strength. If you, for example, provides information, they, there are so many, let's say, uncertainties that uh, someone could dispute all the reasons you showed uh, all the difficulties of detecting. So how, let's say, how do you think uh, how how far or how close we are to use? Uh, uh, yeah, so just as a remark, so if you recall, so there were this MARPOL, that is the worldwide convention about preventing oil uh, over the ocean. So in these limits, that means that if you have a larger, so you are spilling more than what is there, so you definitely see it on the side image. The problem is that even if you detect an oil spill, so you have like the ship and the trail 
large trail, long trail uh, behind the ship, which is oil, and you say, okay, this is oil. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, go to court and say, okay, you are the culprit of this oil spill, you have to pay for the damages. Because first of all, only with the SAR image, you have the detection of, of the ship, but it's not an optical image. You, you have the detection, but you don't see the name. You don't, you don't have an identification of the ship, right? So what is done? What is done by EMSA? So usually you have this, and then you integrate with what, what I will show you now, what is called automatic identification system. So this system is uh, a tracking system of the ships. So, and when you have like, you have the SAR image, you have the track of the ship, and then you match like the example I showed before. Even in this case, it was, it, I think it, it's not yet accepted that you can, because with the AIS, you have the name of the ship, you have the company, you have the so-called MMSI, so you have a specific, so you identify the ship and you identify the company. But what is done, actually in court, they, you need to have in situ verification. So this is what, for example, that's why I said, what EMSA is doing, they offer the service to the member states. So when they detect an oil, they can identify the ship with AIS. They send this information to the member states, say, look, here something happening. Please go and check, right? The problem is that, uh, I mean, if you read through the EMSA reports, you see that through the clean CNET, there is a decrease, since the clean CNET is there, there is a decline of number of oil spills that have been detected with SAR, because if you have a service, you think twice before doing an illegal thing, right? So if you, if you know that, then you can be called on court and you have to pay. So for the deep water horizon, for example, so uh, they, they, in that case, it's an accident. And I think it's British Petroleum that had to pay for the cleaning of the beaches, of all the damages and so on, but for this routine operation. So CleanCNET will send the information to the member state and then the member state patrol control needs to go there or fly with the pollution airplane and then stop them because you have the so-called oil record book. So there you need to so the captain has to say, okay, how much oil there is there? How much was the charge? And if you see a mismatch, then you have a court proof. So it's, it's a, as I said, so SAR is like the first step. So you first, it's the early warning system because from there, then of course you go all the steps through. So up to the, how to say, uh, yeah. Uh, check that uh, everything was, was uh, actually happening. And but what about the regions where there are quite a lot of, it's quite cloudy and so on. So I understand that you use this. Clouds? So Clouds are not... Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean oh. that's the question. So you need this one. So they, need, they, do, they use this one, like SAR data, uh, like early warning to then go to check, like for example, high resolution optical image as well. Like uh, uh, dust, dust, dust. Yeah, they, they, they do this, so, yes. And then, like, what's, <coughs> what's the solution when they cannot uh, get the... So, for example, you detect the OSPO possibility, and then they check for the uh, optical injury, from, for example, from Maxa or whatever, and then uh, if it's basically cloudy and so on, uh, so then basically it's sort of no, no one can do anything, or, or then it's just... Uh, no, well, what I mean is that the... The, 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 let's say the information you have from SAR is, okay, you know the location, you, you know the latitude and longitude, you know the extent, more or less, right, of what, what is happening. This information is passed through the national pollution control. I don't know here which entity. So in Italy we have uh, Guardia Costiera. Coast Guards. No Coast Guards, yeah, right. Everywhere. So the Coast Guards, then they need to go over there, 
or if, if the, the country has a um, airplane pollution control, then they can fly over and check. So uh, you, need, you need to uh, yeah, check in, in C2 as well. So to, let's say, to, uh, to identify the culprit and then bring this to court. We did a similar course to this, uh, just about uh, um, oil spills and ship detection for ISA, uh, with SAR, it was 20 years ago. And they already at the time they were using, uh, they didn't have the Sentinels, of course, uh, there was not uh, Terra Salix. Was they, were, they were using Envisat yeah. plus Radasat. They were combining European and uh, um, I guess Canadian uh, the radar information. Radasat is still used by YAMSA. Yes, and already at that time, just with these uh, two systems, uh, they were doing that uh, routinely, and they had um, very often uh, uh, radar acquisitions. And as soon as they suspected that it was an oil spill, because you cannot be certain 100%, because there could be other artifacts uh, with oil spills. No, we already but discussed as, this. As soon as they had suspects that it would be an oil spill, and then they saw also a ship nearby, uh, then they immediately informed the member states, and they would send the Coast Guards to, to the place, and uh, uh, then they could... Uh, uh, this is uh, the routine operation yeah. that is done. And they were yes. doing with all the member states of EMSA. I, I just want to mention one point that is a critical point. And uh, although, as I said, if you read the reports from EMSA and CleanCNET, they show the statistics of how many satellites are image were acquired, how many oil spills were acquired over the time, and then you see a nice decline, right? But keep in mind, so we are using SAR satellites that are polar orbiting, so you have passes over Europe either in the morning or in the afternoon, and in between, you don't know. So you actually, you see this decrease, but you don't know uh, in, the, in, in between what is happening. So that's why more satellites is the way, the more the better. So we should not yeah. inform the, the ships that there are passes only in the uh, morning. I'm, 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 they could they decide to clean the reservoirs at uh, noon. I'm, I'm afraid that maybe, uh, I mean, if they, if they do these illegal things, they might get informed of what, uh, what EMSA is doing. And Some people could decide to attend these courses just to overcome the capability of, <laughs> of the Yeah, <laughs> but uh, of, course, of course, besides uh, the satellite uh, monitoring, of course, you have the standard routine operation monitoring, like the Coast Guard and other things. So it's, of course, not everything based on satellites, but uh, they are of a great help because, as I see, as I've shown you, ocean is quite large. So are there questions about? Okay, actually, if it's, if it's a little bit, what you mean, a little bit, uh, it's then uh, probably not an option. Usually, uh, oil, so we did some experiment releasing some biogenic oil, and it was like 10 liters or something, and in 10 minutes, because what is happening is that the oil spread very fast, stretch very fast. So, you have different uh, processes that you can read in these slides about uh, SAR oil spill interpretation. You have biodegradation, you have the spreading. So there are certain uh, phenomena that are fast, like spreading and moving, because if there is wind, current, oil moves fast. And then there are other processes like biodegradation, emulsion. This takes a little bit longer, but I mean, you can do the experiment at home, which is no, as soon as you put oil on water, pst, you have like a very uh, fast spreading of oil. And also because uh, the oil thickness, we are talking about micrometers. So it's very, very, very thin uh, layers over the sea surface. So. Other questions about the topic or?
We can switch to ships. OK. So bit of motivation. So why we want to have uh, ship detection? This is mostly, yeah, should be already be clear to you. We have large uh, oceans, so the area to cover is large. And if you see the worldwide uh, ship density map based on the so-called automatic identification system data in 2021, and then you see that besides you can see the major routes between the continent. Please. Yes. Uh, okay, I was a bit fast here because we are running out of time, but uh, this is uh, a study where basically we compared the so-called standard features, which means standard you just have a single pole image where you extract uh, the size, the spreading, the length, the area, and the only radar parameters that you have there is the radar backscatter. So with uh, polarimetry, you have more features, right? So all the features that I, I introduced in the morning, you have the CPD that I show some example, you have the correlation, entropy, alpha. These parameters can be extracted from, from dual pole. And what we did here, we said, OK, are they really features that help the classifier in discriminating the oil from lookalike, and the answer is given by by this this table here. So what is here? You see the top features are the one that gives you more information about uh, discriminating, and these are like they are abbreviated, but they are like geometric intensity, the polarization ratio, span is the total power. Then you have the fourth is the power ratio of the objects. And then you have anisotropy, the contrast. So contrast is usually, is there defined is the ratio between the backscatter you measure, for example, over the dark area and of the surrounding sea surface, right? And then you have the standard deviation of the object. You see, all these parameters are all polarimetric features. I guess the first standard uh, parameter is the max, what's called max underscore contrast, contrast. So this is the, what I said. So the contrast is the ratio between the backscatter that you measure over the dark area and the backscatter you measure uh, from the surrounding ocean. But all the others are top 10, so you have nine polarimetric features and one standard. So this was kind of study that proved that with polarimetry, you help your classifier uh, yeah, training better. So I don't know how many of you are in the AI topic, machine learning. So machine learning, uh, yeah, of course, you need uh, a lot of data first of all, to train the network. But previously, before the convolutional neural networks, there was the so-called features engineering. So people were interested, OK, I want to reduce the number of features that helps my classifier. Because in some cases, you have more information that does not help your classifier, actually makes classifier more confusing. So and uh, that's why here we did this study. So here, I guess, we use 
a support vector machine as a background classifier. So we classify the things and then we said, okay, which one is, which features are more uh, relevant, okay? And, uh, yeah. Okay. No other question on oil? Okay, so uh, how many of you already know about AIS? Because if you already know, I will skip some slides. Nobody, okay. So what is AIS? So actually this system was kind of invented for vessel collision avoidance. So, and um, basically works exchanging messages between ship and ship and ship and, uh, and shore base station. So basically if you have your own ship and you have uh, an AIS receiver, you receive the messages from all the ships and then you can uh, integrate this information in your uh, pilot uh, cockpit, right? And then you see all the ships around you. Uh, so these messages are basically sent and received by the transceiver of the, of the AIS using radio waves. So basically using the VHF, so very high frequency channel. There are two channels that are dedicated to AIS. So you see there the details about frequency and the channel name. And basically it works on what is the called transmission protocol. So the base is this time division uh, multiple access protocol, which basically means that you uh, use a slot in time to send your message, right? Uh, there are different classes of AIS. So just for your information, the most you know, famous, most known ones are so-called class, class A and class B. So the class A are mandatory for large vessels. And class B are uh, receivers that are for small vessels. So the difference is that class A is uh, a little bit stronger in power. You have uh, the possibility to have a display which shows you the information about the surrounding ships and, and, um, and so on. So, so each minute is divided in 2,250 time slots, right? And because we said we have two channels, we have 4,500 time slots available. So the ship, so the IRS responded, allocates a time slot to say, okay, I use this time slot to send my message. How many message types you have? There are 27, so I don't want to bother you with all of them, but two are basic for us, right? So there is the so-called position message, which is, yeah, named one, two, three, four, 18, 27, blah, blah, blah. So this is uh, differentiated between class A and class B. Don't worry about it. And then there is the static uh, and voyage message. So the position message, it includes, so it identifies the ship via the so-called MMSI. And then you have the latitude, you have the longitude, you have timestamp, you have the speed over, uh, speed over ground, and speed and course, heading. And of course, this information are uh, given to the IES transponder by the other ship's instrument, like from the GPS, from the gyroscope, and blah, blah, blah. And then you have the static and uh, voyage message. So these messages uh, provides uh, the name of the shape, which type it is, which dimension, the length and the width. It gives you the estimated time of arrival. So very, very similar is what, what you see uh, also for airplanes. So you have, for example, flight radar. You go there if you want to see if your flight is delayed, you go and see the track. So it's the same. You can do the same. You go to websites that shows you 
live PIS messages, and then you see where the ship is, right? The difference is that this static information is compiled by humans, so by the operator. So the captain installed the device and says, okay, my ship name is this, my length of the ship is this, and so sometimes it's not that reliable because it's compiled by a human, we are prone to errors, so we have seen like strange things happening in some uh, AIS data, but, um, and uh, the other question is how often these positions, messages and static messages are sent. So this depends on the status of the ship, if it's a tanker, if it's moving, and it ranges between two seconds and three minutes, while the static messages are sent independently each six minutes, right? So, so basically this information is what was used to generate the previous uh, map showing you the density of uh, ships around the globe. So who has a mandatory NIS message, an NIS uh, receiver, transponder? So all passenger ships, they are mandatory, required to have an AIS. All the other ships which are uh, larger than 300 gross tonnage and uh, doing international voyages, and cargo ships uh, larger than 500 uh, gross tonnage, also if not engaged in international voyages. This is the general regulation given by the SOLAS, safety of of the seas or something like this. And of course, there are additional regional regulations like the EU, for example, put a mandatory uh, yeah, uh, IS on board fishing ships that are larger than 50 meters length, quite important because of the legal fishing, and also for commercial uh, US flagged uh, fish ships, which are larger than 65 meters. So what are the limits of this system? The limits is, of course, given by the line of sight radio wave propagation, right? So two ships that are far away, more than 40, 50 kilometers, will not see each other. So we not receive the message because of the curvature of the earth. So the, the radio, prop radio propagation will not reach this. So as a rule of thumb, so if you have a base station, of course, this line of sight uh, depends on the, on the height of the, of the receiver. If you have like a base station on about 100 meters above the sea level, you have a coverage of around 35 to 40 kilometers. So this is so-called terrestrial AIS. And this is the limit in the horizontal range of AIS. Fortunately, so it was uh, also discovered that AIS messages can be received by satellite. So this is called satellite AIS. Uh, of course, the satellites are orbiting in a LEO orbit. And uh, some, some uh, issues related to the satellite AIS is that from satellites, then you have a very, very large coverage. And we have seen that you have limited time slots that can be allocated. So sometimes you have this uh, conflict in messages, which nowadays there are companies that are building satellite AIS. They are doing the processing either on board or on ground and can avoid these conflicts. And of course, from satellites, you have like not a real track. So you have like position now and maybe the next position will be like in one hour because the satellite is passing in one hour, while the terrestrial AIS, you have the track of the ship, right? Kind, kind of in real time. So for what are used, so there are different use. So uh, what I want to point out here is, as we said, this information is very precious for, as an added value for SAR, oil spill and ship detection. 
because as we said before, so if you detect the oil, you can detect the ship, but you want to identify the ship and you can merge the AS information with, with the SAR satellite and then identify the ship with, with the AS. And just as a reminder, so the captain of a ship, of a tanker, is not allowed to turn off the AIS unless there are some security, safety emergencies. Okay, otherwise, easy to turn off, spill the oil, go away. It's not like it works. So you have the, if they switch off, they have to uh, justify why it was done. So how the ship are detected. So here we have a ship over the ocean, nice ocean waves surface. We have the satellite is acquiring uh, the image with a, with a certain field, let's call it the field of view, so it's called incidence angle. Then we already know uh, that the ship is a metallic structure, right? And everything that is metal reflects well the radio waves, so it's good. And because the ship uh, and the ocean are kind of creating this dihedral, so you have like very strong double bounds of the, of the transmitted uh, electromagnetic waves through the bounds between ocean, ship, and back, right? You might have also direct reflection from the ship itself because it's, it's a metallic structure. And then that's why in the side image also you've seen before, you see very bright dots. And of course, we have the surrounding ocean. We have already discussed about it. So we have, uh, uh, in this case, VV and HH polarization. So this is how the backscatter of the ocean develop with, uh, with the instance angle. So how you look uh, the ocean surface. And if you see, like, if you are acquiring with very high, so very large incidence angle, then the arrows there points to uh, the curve of radar backscatter that is low. If you have high backscatter from the ship, and this is why you have very strong returns from the ship, a very dark area around the ship. So that's single pole detection, that means you basically are detecting bright spots inside image. You can do it basically saying, okay, take the amplitude image, HH is usually preferred over VV because the contrast between the ship and the ocean is a little bit higher because we have seen. So in VV you have higher ocean backscatter and then see and say, okay, Whatever is larger than this threshold is a ship, right? So again, as a reminder, if you go in SNAP, there is a ship detection there, you can do it. So, and it asks you, okay, what threshold you want to set, right? So it's basically this. So then what happens when you have uh, a lower incidence, incidence angle? We have said that SAR is flexible, to cover the same area with different uh, geometric view, you can steer the beam of the antenna and acquire the image uh, with a lower, with higher instance angle. So what happens in this case is of course, in this case, you reduce the double bounds a little bit between ocean and ship. So you get a little bit less return from the ship. And what it happens is that you get actually more backscatter from the ocean. So you can even, if you go very steep, you get like specular reflection from the ocean. So you get very strong uh, uh, backscatter. So that's why here you see that you have still the ship visible, the sprite, but the background is also higher, right? And in that case, you have a little bit uh, mm, less satisfactory results if you say, okay, detect everything that is bright because you might end up in detecting pixels that are actually oceans. Uh, how ships looks like inside image. Here I show you some example 
of three types of ship. So the columns are like the same ship that has been seen by the same satellite, but using different modes. So if you remember, there is scansar, large coverage, low resolution, up to spotlight, small coverage, high resolution. And then you see, of course, for small, medium, and large ship, of course, the resolution plays a role, right? So less resolution, you might end up in not detecting the ship. Uh, then the question is, what is the minimum ship length that you can detect, right? So uh, some um, researcher from, from Canada, they developed a tool which uh, predicts what is uh, the minimum ship length versus the incidence angle. They did it first for C-band, so basically the radar sat satellites, they extended also to X-band, and uh, the plots that you see here, so the uh, blue uh, is for C-band, and red is for X-band, and uh, solid line and dashed line are for two different resolutions. So we are talking about low resolution here, so the uh, um, continuous line is about 40 meters, and the dashed line is 18 meters. And then you see that, so according to the previous theoretical uh, model, that as far as the incidence angle increase, then the minimum ship length decrease. So in the y-axis, you have the minimum ship length. This is log scaled, right? So higher incidence angle is better. Lower incidence angle is not so good, right? And here it's nice because then you can compare also the frequency. So you can compare the C-band with X-band, where it shows that X-band, it performs a little bit better than C-band, and this is because of the wavelength. So wavelength is a little bit shorter, smaller, so you have a little bit um, uh, higher probability to detect a smaller ship in X-band than in C-band, right? Uh, here, the plots are the same, more or less. This is uh, uh, a study to estimate, again, what is the probability of detection theoretically with SAR, depending also on the wind speed. And in this case, for different uh, ship classes, we have small ship, that range from 1 to 25 meters, medium ship, medium ship 25 to 150 meters. Uh, sorry, that's a mistake there. So that's large ship for length uh, larger than 150 meters. So what I want to point out here is that, again, so wind speed here plays a role, right? Because if you large ships, you basically have almost a certainty with a resolution of three meters to detect this ship. So independently on the instance angle, independently of the wind speed, you see the right hand side, you see probability of detection is red almost everywhere. As far as you move to the left, right, so going to the small ship, then you see that when the wind speed starts to increase, then you have a lower probability to detect the ship. That's because, as we said, higher the wind speed, higher the backscatter from the ocean, then the contrast between ocean and ship starts to decrease, right? Uh, so here an example of about uh, what is the role of polarization, right? So we have talked about all the morning about sub-polar, about SAR polarimetry, so here you see like uh, a small part of a Google Earth image where there are two small platforms. These are about yeah, eight meters and 4.5 meters. And here you have the single pole image. Then you see that both target with single pole, high resolution, three meters, they are 
giving you a strong backscatter response. So you see the white blobs in this red circle. However, when you do polarimetry, remember that we said there are side effects. So one is reducing the resolution. And here you see it. For example, if you have a look at the same scene acquired by quad pole, uh, in the quad pole mode, you see the comparison between single pole and quad pole. And then you see that the upper left target is actually not visible. So it means the resolution is low and, and you don't get uh, information. And the same is actually happening if you have a look at VB. Because in polarimetry, we said you have more information. You have the HH, you have the V. In that case, the upper left is detected, but the target in the middle is not. But the good news is that with polarimetry, you have also the cross-pole channel, which shows you that both then are detected. So yes, you reduce the resolution, but you gain information about the scattering mechanism that are, that are in place, right? So that's the message. Questions about ship uh, differentiation within wavelength, minimum ship size, polarization, all clear, all fine, good. OK, what are challenges? So the first challenge is, was mentioned in the morning, whatever it moves <laughs> is not a friend of SAR. Because a ship, they can be a tanker, but they, they also move. And when you have a component, the radial component of the ship velocity, these produce the so-called train of the track effect. That means the ship will be geographically displayed. Uh, so it's not in the real position, but it's an effect due to the SAR uh, focusing algorithm, right? So this because the component of the, component of the velocity have, uh, creates a Doppler shift, and the Doppler shift in the SAR image, you, in the image formation, you're seeing that everything is static. And this Doppler shift then produce this shift. So if it's toward the radars, it goes up. If it's uh, away from the radar, it goes down. And you see here an example where we have in the background, we have a SAR image and a moving ship tracked with the IS. So this purple, I have a purple. The cyan arrows doing this snake, <coughs> it's actually the AIS message received by the, the sent by the ship. And then you see that the actual position of the ship is more than 200 meters away. <coughs> what is as image, imaged by the ship? Of course, this has a, an impact on the, on the parameter estimation because you want to retrieve also the location of the ship, right? You detect and locate and give this to a GIS where any uh, system to show the position of the ship. Uh, then the other effect is related to the component of the velocity of the ship along track, right? So, so who does know about a long track azimuth across track? You know, so component, a long track of the ship creates a so-called defocusing. That means the ship will appear stretched, right? So it's not focused anymore, but it's this backscatter is a little bit spread along uh, track. So in azimuth. And this, of course, has an impact on the ship length estimation. So the example there, there's a ship. The length is 68 meters. If you load 
the image with the G software and then you measure the length, then you see that the ship actually appears like 85 meters. So this is of course the problem. And you see the plot that shows you that uh, the relation between uh, ship length estimation versus the true ship uh, length given by the IS. So we have there uh, a root mean square error, error about 70, 17 meters. Uh, another effect is the so-called uh, yeah, cross-like radar response. So of course, ships are large and they have large dihedral structure. And have we seen, have we seen that whenever we have a dihedral, you have a strong double bounce. And what, what happens is that you have the signal that is spread in a cross-like uh, way. And this, of course, impacts the estimation of the ship suites, because you detect all the pixels belonging to the ship. You also detect these bright lines uh, in the y direction. And of course, your ship will, uh, will be estimated with the, with the wrong width, right? So of course, all these are effects that can be mitigated with some image processing techniques. Uh, another problem is so-called azimuth ambiguity or ghosts. Uh, yeah, it's a tough topic, but basically because the SAR is sampling the Doppler spectrum uh, in a finite way, you have all the signals that are outside the process bandwidth to fall down to the, to the inside the process bandwidth. So basically, say it very easily, you basically have real ships and ghosts. So these are like artifacts that you can have uh, inside image. And here you, you see an example of, of real ships and the arrows points out to azimuth ambiguities. So these are replicas that are there, but uh, if you use simply the detection algorithm, okay, detect everything that is above a certain threshold, of course you will detect also these ambiguities, right? So, and of course, this has a strong impact on the performances because if you detect the ghosts, you are increasing the false alarms. So these are not ships, are ghosts. So, and of course you want to avoid this. Okay, this is just another example that this can happen not only from ship, but also from land. You see strong uh, replicas of uh, the city over the ocean, here is for Terrazarix. You see. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, how is it possible to deal with the azimuth ambiguity? Like, how do you filter out the other calculations? I I will show you some some example in a minute. So, so just wait a little bit, then we go to the topic because it's something that I I try to address. Okay. Okay. So basically it's, <laughs> the answer is here. So these are, uh, is the workflow of the steps. So parallel to what we have seen for oil spill, the steps that are needed to uh, detect ships on, on side images. So here is uh, the workflow. Most of the steps are again also implemented in SNAP. So you can try masking the land and detect the ship as well. So you are encouraged to go there, download some images and uh, test yourself this. So we have several steps, right? We have so-called basic step, a more advanced step. So of course the first step is a detection or pre-screening. So in the green, there are different techniques you can use 
global threshold, you just have the whole image and say, okay, everything is above this, is a ship, the work is fast, but the performances are not so, so good. And then you have the so-called CIFAR detector, which is very used in radars, so it stands for constant false alarm rate. We will see how it works. Then you have the step that is advanced, so about refinements of the detection, so try to uh, mitigate the problems that we saw before, like the smearing in Azimut or the cross-like uh, features that you have on the ship. Then you have the land mask, and then of course you have the parameter extraction. So you want to extract the length, the width, the heading. In some cases you can, you can extract also the, the velocity. Not so easy for using single pole amplitude image. So, and this image product here, you have like different, different modes, scan star, strip map, spotlight. And usually uh, you use so-called ground range detected product. So if you go in the HISA hub and you want to download some Sentinel image, you see there, it asks you, okay, which product level you want. And you usually have like the acronym SLC or GRD. GRD means that you get a product that is detected. Detected in this case means that you get only the amplitude without the phase of the side image, right? I'll show you some example of ship detection using also the phase later on. And then ancillary data here are like some annotation file. So you need to mask the land, an external data set possible uh, TRS uh, data stream then that is used to identify the ship in the final product. So I guess uh, uh, in SNAP, uh, the CIFAR should be uh, implemented. Uh, Azimut ghost removal, I do not guess it's implemented. And also refinements, I don't think it's implemented, but you can do it with the pipelines. So we will show you how it's uh, done uh, this. Uh, oh, battery is low. Uh, yes. Yeah, just a second because the battery. Yep. So these are the steps. Uh, just want to explain a little bit how the CIFAR works because this is the, the most used algorithm for, for ship detection. So, so the concept of CIFAR is that you want to keep the false alarm rate constant, right? And uh, you see here the histogram of, of uh, the amplitude image, and basically you want to change the threshold in a way that the false alarm is kept constant because as we see, the radar backscatter over the ocean, it change. So you have different distributions. Uh, and uh, so what, what you want to achieve is actually what is shown here. So you have the input image. Is, this is just a small snippet of a SAR image with a ship. And you want to have a nice detection mask, which it's a binary image. So zero, it's given by ocean. And one, it's given by uh, given two, two pixels that are belonging to the ship. So of course, this detector is uh, compared to the global threshold, global threshold is a little bit more complex and it's pixel based. So you want to analyze all the pixels in the image. And when you go with very high resolution images, the number of pixels you have there or with large coverage like Sentinel, you have, you have to run this algorithm uh, quite a lot of times. So it could be computationally expensive. Yeah, so this is 
or 12. You put the threshold there to have the detection, right? Uh, yeah, so D here is just once the threshold is defined, so the probability of false alarms is actually the area below the probability density function uh, for a fixed threshold. So how it works, I say it, so it's kind of uh, nested uh, sliding, moving windows. So you have the so-called here, you have a background window, a so-called guard window and target. If you go in snap and you want to try yourself, it will ask you, okay, how large is your background window? How large is your guard window? And how large is your target window? So this is done because the background window is used to estimate the ocean, let's say the ocean clutter, right? So because based on this, you want to detect everything that is not ocean. The guard window is there to guard, so to avoid that part of your target goes inside the background window and pollute the background estimation. And then you have the target window. So that's it's what you compare with the values of the background window. So and then you have to run these along all the image, right? So here it shows you how it works. So you to do step by step, you see that this program is changing, it's changing also the threshold, it goes to the target, then the target, you set the threshold that uh, follows the probability of false alarm that you set, and then the target is detected. Then there was the idea of CIFAR iterations. This is the case when, for example, we have this image, right? Then we have our CIFAR set up with background window and guard window. So then you have your threshold, everything that is above this threshold, are the chips, so you see the results on, on the detection map at the first iteration. But you should notice that the ship that's actually there is missing. And is missing because there are three ships, right, that are polluting your estimation of the background. So the idea of iterative CIFAR is that you have run the first iteration, you have your map, and then in the second iteration, you go back, but you are ex excluding the previous detected targets. So then you have a better estimation of, of the background. So you see the threshold before was too high, right? So that target did not uh, uh, have enough yeah, amplitude or strong strength to be above that threshold so it was not detected. In the second case, so because you are estimating better the background, then the threshold is lower and then in this case you have the detection of the missing ship. Uh, here are some examples of, of algorithm using single loop complex. I don't think these are implemented in SNAP, so if you don't mind, because we are running out of time, I will just skip this uh, part and go directly to some example of dual pole. So, so here the approach is using reflection symmetry, so uh, we are discriminating ships and ocean surface using uh, dual pole, copole, and cross pole uh, channels. So dual pole uh, polarimetric data. Uh, some examples here for Terra Zarix in X band, two data set, there are some ships there. You can read all about it later on. What I want to show you is that uh, you have the so called air image, processed image on. on for both side set on the left and right, and then you see the detection. So you see that the ocean follows the reflection symmetry approach 
which makes the ocean totally black. So this is something good if you want to detect bright spots because the black, so the lower the ocean backscatter, the better you can detect the ships. Yeah, so this was uh, an example where we use also dual pole and to validate the algorithm using this small control boat here, as you see a uh, picture was something like four meters. And here is a, a 3D scattering plot of, of the ship, which was image, which was uh, the strength in HH, the strength in HV, and then combining HH and V in amplitude, and also combining HH and VV with phase. And then you see on the, uh, bottom right said that this peak is much higher than the ocean surface, which is in that case color coded as blue. So that helps a lot uh, for the, the ship detection, right? Yeah, so I don't know about uh, how you know about um, rock curves. So this was uh, just to show you that Comparing this algorithm with standard technique, we could get better performance. So we could uh, increase the probability of detection, keeping uh, the same probability of false alarms. And uh, the algorithm works in different frequencies. So it was tested on L band. It was tested also in C band uh, with quite good uh, results. And to come back to the azimuth ambiguity, so here's the slide that I want to show. So either you, in the step where it was in the workflow, discriminating the azimuth ambiguity, you actually make use of these relationships. So we said that the azimuth ambiguity are Gauss replicas displayed in azimuth direction, and they have a fixed uh, displacement. And displacement is given by the equation here. So what we use, you detect everything. And then from the detection, you check, OK, do I detect anything also from this ship on top or above? If yes, if it's exactly at, like in this case, you see, in this case uh, on the right, we have this building that is showing in the ocean. And it's fixed. It's 3.6 kilometers approximately. So if it's that distance, then you remove it. So this is part of the filtering. Uh, another technique for to remove uh, azimuth ambiguity is using quad pole. So again, this was how it quad pole works. So I just want to show you the example. So here we make use of the both cross-pole channel in quad pole image to discriminate the ships. Actually, what we do is we create, uh, sorry, we, cre we create so-called ambiguity-free HV image because uh, according to the rules here, so it, VH and HV channels are equal for targets but are opposite in phase for ambiguities. So we make use of this polarimetric feature to beforehand just remove uh, the ambiguity and have an image without ambiguities. So here in an example, you see a lot of uh, strong uh, ambiguities over the ocean, which are not detected, uh, as you see, either for land and for ship. And another example that shows uh, the effect of uh, different polarimetric features. So you see what is highlighted in red is what is using the HV, HV free image. And if you directly compare with the image above, you see that all the replicas of the Gibraltar island are actually not there, right? So then when you do your detection, you are actually detecting only the real ship and not the ghosts. So here, yeah, just a bit comparison between uh, this method with other methods. So literature is 
quite uh, large, also dealing with polarimetric uh, discrimination of azimuth ambiguities. And uh, I think it's time to close, right? I just want to thank you for your attention and uh, show you here a nice movie where we combined satellite image with uh, radar based, uh, so so-called VAMOS wave radar system. And you see also the AIS of this ship that are running and then you see the same uh, on the radar. So what, what was here with this uh, dot that is appearing there, it's actually, yeah, you see it there? It's actually a small rubber boat that was released by the mother boat, that was what is named here Bayreuth. And suddenly because this yellow arrow was coming up, so they were afraid that <laughs> there would be some collision. And then you see suddenly that this uh, small dot that is tracked with the GPS is going to the mother boat that is given by the AIS by this red uh, arrow. So that's everything I wanted to tell you about oil and ship. So there are many more other topics about uh, marine applications, but uh, those are the ones that I know better. So if there are questions. Yeah, anyway, we don't have much more time. I think the course was quite dense. We tried in one week to cover many different yeah. applications. It was not possible to cover more or to go in more detail for each application because you have seen that especially for uh, um, items like a radar interferometry yesterday, you could have just uh, two weeks or three weeks, of course, ju just about that. So uh, it's a real challenge to try to pass you the information about so many different things in uh, five days. Um, the real purpose of these uh, courses is, n of course, is not, we don't expect that you will become expert about uh, each uh, application just uh, with this course. I think, at least for as far as I'm concerned, when I did similar courses in the past, the real purpose was to understand whether I liked um, some subject and I found that it was uh, uh, applicable to my um, uh, to what I was doing if I wanted to get uh, further into it so now you had the information you know who are the experts or at least some of the experts so if you really decide to go into one of the fields that you have seen of course you had to continue studying on this we have told you about many other opportunities that we have also online but you know the experts, so you could decide to contact them and to uh, f um, have further uh, experience and training on the subject. So thanks, Domenico, for accepting to come. I know that you had the challenges also with the flight from Germany. Yes. Finally, we made it. Otherwise, it would have been also a remote presentation. But uh, uh, thanks, God, you managed to come. So thanks again. And, uh, yeah. Of course, I will be around, uh, I guess, until lunchtime. And maybe you have given your uh, contact, email contact to the students in case they want to Yeah, contact sure. You. Just approach me. We can discuss. Yeah. So, so now this part of the course is finished, the academic part. Um, OK, I think you have a little present for Domenico. From, uh, Ministry of Education and Science oh. of all the Oh, very nice of you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So this part of the course is finished. We still have this afternoon. Wait, don't go away because we have just 10 minutes more uh, now. Um, so this afternoon will be different. You will see, um, okay, some Jupyter notebook uh, um, examples. Uh, Amalia and Magdalena Firchik from Poland, uh, working in ISA, will show that to you. You will also have some presentations about uh, Latvian uh, projects in Earth observation, uh, I think by... Um, well, uh, experts here around. So uh, that will uh, um, allow you to connect what you've seen with real projects done uh, in the region. So it should be interesting. Uh, there is uh, something more. Uh, so, okay, first of all, Amalia will just tell you, I think she put in the chat some uh, additional resources related to uh, radar for oil spill and ship detection. So um, she will tell you uh, something more about that. And then after that, uh, a colleague from ours, from ISA, ESTEC, Karol Brzostowski, 
uh, from Poland, working in ESTEC. He's the country desk officer for Latvia and also for Croatia and Slovenia. He will tell you more about opportunities uh, in industrial uh, foreign companies and in the industrial field. Okay, yes, so because what we saw this morning is theory, no? So we wanted you to have the chance to practice a bit and in the chat you find two things. Um, there are two webinars coming from the Rus Copernicus project. So uh, the webinars go from the very beginning on how to acquire the data and download, download them to the theory behind and uh, processing it in SNAP. And they cover oil spill mapping and ship detection without the AIS part though. And uh, the second thing is um, one of the modules in the SAR MOOC. So in the SAR MOOC, you find all the theory uh, about SAR and you can personalize your path choosing the modules that you like. And there is a module about water applications, which includes a part about maritime, applica maritime applications with an exercise about uh, oil spill mapping. So I, I left you the links in the chat. All the lectures this week have been recorded, so we will uh, um, try to put the videos uh, uh, somewhere. Either will be on the web page of the course or on the ISA web page. So this is something we still have to decide, so that you can go through the lectures again if you wish. And I uh, think you will also get all the presentations. Yes, of course. Yeah. So maybe Amalia, you could add the information you put in the chat and the last slide of Domenico's presentation, yes. because since uh, it's related to. Yes. We will add this to the thank you email where you will receive the certificates. Yeah. Okay, so now Carol can say something about uh, industrial uh, projects and opportunities. Yeah, uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know that you are probably hungry and waiting for lunch, so I will be quite fast. I will try to be quite fast, but I think it will be quite useful uh, information for you. As was mentioned by Francesca, I am country desk officer for Latvia. Uh, I am working in such section which is very complex name. It is New Associate and Cooperating State section. However, our section is dealing with new countries in ISA. When the country is approaching ISA, the full integration process is very long. It is 20 plus year to, from the beginning to the end. Latvia is more or less in the middle. Latvia is associate member. So in the beginning is a cooperation agreement, then is specs, then is associate membership, new, members, new member state and full member state. So we are in the middle. And our section is supporting the countries. And we are working like that, that each country has separate country desk officer, so person dedicated to the country. And we are trying to support country on different levels, starting from delegation. So I am dealing a lot with, with uh, Kaspars, uh, probably you know Kaspars, uh, Angelina as well, and all the, let's say, political uh, environment. Uh, also, I am supporting entities in this integration process because, as you know, working with ISA is not always very easy. I hope it is nice in the end, but not easy, especially in the beginning. Um, so I know more or less all, I believe, entities in Latvia which are doing something in space or wishing to do something in space. That's why I would like to take this opportunity to to introduce myself to you because uh, I know that many of you, 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 you don't know me, uh, I don't know you. Uh, but in case you will have any questions related with whatever topic related with space or ISA, you can always approach me, you can send email. Uh, and yes, uh, I would like to share two slides or three slides because if it will be feasible, uh, this one, yeah? Because as was mentioned uh, by, by Francesco, okay, the, the aim of this meeting probably was to get some knowledge, of course, which will be very useful, but in the end, you must do something with this knowledge. Uh, because knowledge for knowledge uh, is not, not very useful in the end. Uh, and so, uh, from my perspective, how you can use this knowledge? It depends, of course, if you are from industry, from academia, or from administration. There's different ways. However, all this, uh, three, let's say, kind of entities could support, uh, or let's say, could be included in cooperation with DISA. If you are in administration, it doesn't mean that we don't want or there is no chance to cooperate with us. Uh, however, I believe that this uh, cooperation between you three, I mean industry, academia, and uh, government or administration is very 
very useful and uh, very beneficial for everyone, especially in Earth observation domain, because as it was mentioned many times probably, and also it will be mentioned, there will be some examples probably from Dainis and all, all people from Latvia. Uh, such cooperation is very useful. I mean, industry delivering something which is useful for, for government or administration. I don't know why I, I cannot share that. Uh, okay, uh, if there is a problem, there is, uh, yeah, perfect. Okay, so I, I, I will give you one, one, uh, one uh, example how you can start working with ISA. So of course, through cooperation with already experienced people you can discuss with, with, with Dainis, there is few entities already uh, from Earth Observation Domain which are working with ISA. For example, Institute Foundation of Environmental Solutions, uh, Baltic uh, Satellite Solutions uh, Services, sorry, and MIX, for example, these three I can mention, they are running quite a lot of contracts with us, probably around 10 already. Uh, so probably it will be direct contact with people from these three entities will be, uh, will be very useful. And I believe some of these entities already try to approach or will try to approach you as a potential customer, if you are, for example, from administration. And I would like to mention one thing, which is called RPA funding scheme. RPA is Requesting Party Activities Program, the program dedicated for Latvia. You've got like national element, when the competition is only limited to, to Latvia. Uh, the next call will be open in September this year, uh, but of course I will not go into details. On the 12th of September probably we will have a briefing, so briefing means that you can, we are coming here and we are explaining all details regarding this RP call. What I would like to, to, to show you, uh, sorry, maybe I will change this, yeah. I will show you only, okay. Okay, doesn't work. Okay, I cannot open the next presentation, but uh, yeah, this is the most important. I mean, in this national call, you've, you will have like list of potential activity types which uh, you can submit proposals under with. And I think this is the most important for you and this one. Uh, type F is space applications, space downstream applications. So exactly what was explained today, all this knowledge you can try to uh, use to create some downstream application related with, with Earth observation. And I believe after the launch, there will be some examples of such applications coming from Latvia. And exactly most of them is coming from RPA call or previously PEX call. So uh, not to go further into details, 12th of September, if somebody will be interested, you should be probably invited by Kaspars because it's delegation. And then we are coming here and uh, we will discuss this opportunity in more details. Uh, in the end, I hope, yeah, there is some, this my, this is me. <laughs> so you can take picture and uh, in case you will have any question, you can contact me. This is my manager. However, I, I should be your first contact point. This is not important for you, yes, because it is not, I, I didn't expect that I will have presentation, so I didn't prepare presentation for, for that. Uh, of course, you can always contact uh, Kaspars, Karolis, this head of delegation. And uh, the second person which you can try to contact is David Stebelis. Uh, I don't know if you know him. If not, uh, you can ask Kaspars or, or people working with DISA already. Uh, David is your country uh, can, uh, industrial coordinator. So person living here, he's Latvian, which he should support you in, uh, let's say, also cooperation with this. Okay, if you will have any question, I will be here like for probably one, one and a half hour. Um, just approach me in case you can always send me an email. And I hope we meet in, in one of 
proposals uh, which you will be teaming with with some industry or, or academia. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carol. So uh, take the opportunity to talk to Carol if you have uh, ideas uh, about opportunities or questions. And uh, I take the chance to say goodbye to you because I'm leaving now for lunch, so I will not be here in the afternoon. It was a real pleasure for me to meet you and to work with you. I hope it was also nice for, from your side. And uh, uh, this afternoon, please uh, um, fill the feedback form that we have because we need feedback in order to improve the next courses and to, uh, to know if something was not uh, uh, according to your expectations. We will use it for the next courses, so please do that. Uh, that's all. We don't have the ceremony, the closing ceremony with the certificates because now it's not, no longer in hard copies, so it will be sent to you by email, I understand. Uh, normally we had this uh, ceremony for the last uh, 10 minutes uh, of the course, but uh, now unfortunately everything is done uh, electronically, so that takes part of the charm of <laughs> for my taste. <laughs> all right, good. So. Thanks again and uh, enjoy your lunch and uh, see you next time.